Well, we're lucky today to be standing in front of the Holly at the Bishop Museum. And uh, we're very thankful that they're allowing us to film this. And some of the illustrations that you'll see in this lecture also come from uh, publications by the Bishop Museum. Well, the first slide shows an early drawing made by Weber showing a community uh, on Wy at Waimea, Kauai. And in the background, you'll see the Pavehe design for Hale, or house. Now, in trying to dis discern whether or not the native Hawaiians brought this technology with them or not, it's important to note that the terms that are used for different parts of the house are very similar to terms that are used throughout Polynesia for those same terms. So this suggests that the founders brought this technology with them. Over time, the terms changed a little bit, but they're still very similar to other Polynesian terms for the same material. On this slide, this is a photograph from Malo's publication that shows uh, some of the support elements that made up a, a typical Hawaiian hale. Uh, some of the most important elements are the horizontal ridge pole on the top of the hale, which helps to hold everything together. Uh, the Hawaiian term for this is kauhuhu. Now, at this point, I have to explain that I'm not uh, fluent in Hawaiian and my pronunciations may not be the greatest, but I'm going to do my best, and I'm always welcome to people correcting my pronunciation. Another extremely important element of the house is the vertical ridge pole, or the pauhana. The corner ridge poles at the base of the roof were called pau kihi. Then you can see a number of other vertical posts. These are the posts to which the thatch was applied. And these are preceded by the word aho. So there's the aho hui and the horizontal then thatching posts, the aho pueo. The English term for these is purlins, the thatching rafters. And then we can see also the other vertical elements on the roof, the oa, are rafters as well. This slide just re reviews the terminology that I've just used. This slide shows the rear end portion of the holly in the Bishop Museum where the thatch has been removed. And I've tried to indicate some of the major <clears throat> structural elements um, that make up the house as well as the terminology associated with them. Now, as I mentioned, there was some debate about how much of this technology the founders of Hawaii brought with them. One of the authors, Kamakau, who was a native Hawaiian, thought that the Hawaiians developed their various housing styles sequentially over a fairly substantial period of time. Now, the structures ranged from cave dwellings to walled houses. However, Teirangi Hiroa, or Peter H. Buck, after studying Hawaiian house construction, thought that the founders probably brought all of these designs with them, with maybe a few exceptions, and that there were different housing types that were developed depending on the purpose, where sometimes they were temporary houses that were used for things like fishing. Otherwise, of course, there were many uh, permanent dwellings that were constructed. Now, the basic type of house that the Hawaiians built is referred to as a gabled house. Uh, this is one in which the, there are no horizontal side walls or end walls, but instead the house is composed of four sloping walls that reach to the ground. Here are some examples, photographs on the right-hand side of the picture illustrating the early types of houses, the types of gable houses that were produced. And then on the left, an early painting from one of the contact explorers. Notice that in the two houses on the right, there actually are some side walls, although they're rather small in their extent. In the images on the left, the drawings from ancient Hawaii, uh, side walls aren't apparent, at least in this drawing. 
Here's a photograph taken on the Big Island by Dr. McClatchy that shows the general form and shape of a gabled house. Now you could stand up in the center of this, but you'd have problems standing up towards the sides. Now there's some figures here that Cook uh, recorded on one of his voyages. The large houses, which no doubt were for the Ali'i, uh, could measure 50 by 30 feet, whereas the smaller houses, which were for the commoners, averaged around 12 to 18 feet on the various sides. Okay, here are some more illustrations from the first contact between Europeans and native Hawaiians. And again, it illustrates that the basic type of house that was constructed in those times was the gabled type of house. Also, in the lower right-hand corner, it's hard to see, but the drawing depicts a house that's built on stilts. And this was built near a river and was obviously designed to uh, compensate for a rise in the water level during rainy periods. But it's still basically a gabled house design. Here we can see a skeleton of a hale on the Big Island. Again, this photo was taken by Dr. McClatchy. And you can compare this to the early diagram where I showed all the different elements. But what's important to note here is the houses were typically built on a platform. And this was called the kahua. This is a platform taken at Nuulolo Kai on the island of Kauai. Now, it's not typical of a kahua but I wanted to show it in here. This was built up to support a terrace upon which houses were built. And there are a series of these that are in place against this cliff. But it gives the general appearance of what these kahuas might have looked like. Generally speaking, the platform was one to two feet above the ground level. As mentioned previously, the smaller houses were obviously for the commoners. The posts in general were three to four foot high, and the bark wasn't removed. The larger houses for the Ilihi, as you could imagine, they were higher. The posts were 12 to 14 feet high. The bark was removed, and the tree trunks were actually smoothed and rounded. Also, the best materials were used for the Ilihi. Somewhat, the lesser materials were used for the common people. The next uh, elaboration of the Hawaiian Hale is the adoption of what's called a hip roof. In the hip roof, the roof is slanted on all four sides, and there's always a vertical horizontal wall as well. This provides a lot more headroom uh, throughout the hale and would make standing feasible almost at any place inside. Here are some skeletal designs of a gabled roof house on the left and a hip roof on the right. We're not going to worry about all the details. But I think you can clearly see it's a small difference, but a significant one in terms of utility. On the left is a drawing of a uh, house with a hip roof from an early contact westerner. And on the right is a photograph taken around the turn of the century, the 20th century that is, that shows a typical uh, gabled house construction. In this case, this one with the stone horizontal walls. Now, it's thought that the hip roof was probably a post-contact development, and it's been suggested that perhaps this came from contact with Americans. Now, some of the finer houses had doorways in which there were fairly nice carvings. And in fact, there were experts who were recognized within the community who did this. So this was not something that was done ad hoc, but was done by a really experienced wood carvers. The top arch is curved like the crescent shape of the moon, and it was called the Hoaka because it resembled the moon at its Hoaka stage. The bottom piece was called the Pepe, or threshold. Now, there was a preferred wood for making the doorway, and the Hawaiian word for this was Aakea. Um, the scientific name is Bobea Iletior, or Ilatior. One of the reasons why this was preferred is that when it aged, it turned a red to yellowish color, and this had chiefly qualities. Another wood that was used for this was ulu, or breadfruit, also considered to be suitable. This is a photograph of the Hale at the Bishop Museum, taken shortly after it was reconstructed. Based on its dimensions and its general construction, this was something that was built for the common person and not for the Ali'i. 
I want to point out the braided thatch that you can see along the edge of the doorway. Any place on the holly where the thatch might become unwound or frayed, it was, it was brought into a braid by simple braiding. That would be true on the doorway, and we'll see later, it's also true on the ridge posts. Now this house doesn't have a special doorway as such, so there's no, there are no carvings associated with this door. Now actually, the last step in house construction, before the house could be inhabited, was trimming off the thatch at the top of the doorway. And this area of the door was referred to as the pico. And there was a, a ceremony, probably with chant, that was associated with this step. After the pico was trimmed, then the house could be entered and could be inhabited. This is a close-up showing the way the Hawaiians braided the thatch together to stabilize it at doorways and then also on the ridge pole. In a few cases, uh, there are reports of small porches being built around the doorway. I don't think this was a common practice, but there at least are some drawings that indicate this would obviously provide some manner of protection and a little bit of a barrier between the outer world and the inside of the house. There also are reports that Hawaiians may have built sliding doors that they could open and close at the entrance, but this is not absolutely certain. On this reconstructed house, you can see there is a doorway. Now, the low entrance height probably um, was good in the sense that a large doorway could allow a lot of heat to escape when people entered. And also, especially if there wasn't a barrier door, rain and wind and dust and dirt could blow through the doorway. Perhaps these are reasons why the doorways tended to be small rather than large. Now, most houses had only one door. And while Hawaiians did fight, and we know that there were some famous battles that occurred, it's generally thought that Hawaiian society was relatively peaceful compared to other regions of Polynesia. And in most Polynesian dwellings, there are two or more doors on each house. And it's been thought that this was to allow the occupants, especially the men, to leave the house quickly if there was some threat to the house or to the village. Since Hawaiian society was relatively peaceful, only the men's house and the chief's house tended to have multiple doorways. The chief's house would have between two and three doorways. One of these was very narrow and was extremely kapu, and probably only the chief could enter that particular doorway. But again, there was more than one. This could have been simply maintaining tradition, or it could have some functional uh, significance. We're not sure. The men's house, where the men would sleep, typically had two doors, and again, the hypothesis is this would allow them to exit quickly if they needed to. Windows were apparently not a common feature of the hale of ancient Hawaii, and it's been speculated that windows might have been a post-contact introduction. Here you can see a drawing of a very large house, probably of a chief, and we can see a small window in the background. Now, the thatch that was used on most Hawaiian houses was pili grass. And in the daytime, it certainly would have been translucent, so there would be some you know, light inside of the house in the daytime. And probably Hawaiians spent a lot of their daytime hours outside, tending to taro fields and fishing and doing other activities. Uh, but there probably would be enough light to get through the pili grass to allow for people to see and to do things inside the house. So there may not have been a real need to have windows. Now this is a photograph of a canoe house, and it may seem odd to have a photograph of a canoe house in this presentation, but I think we all know that canoes were very important items for Hawaiians, and that they took a lot of care in building and maintaining them, and it was important to put them in a structure that would you know, preserve them from the elements uh, when they weren't in use. And also, canoe construction and other related activities took place in these canoe houses, which were called hale wa'a. These tended to be very simple. They had gabled roofs and then open end walls. Uh, the size would depend on the type of canoe or the size of the canoe that was in there. And as I mentioned, other related activities like tending to fishing nets, making paddles, probably other types of woodwork would take place in the Haliwa'a. 
Uh, this is a photograph of a large canoe house taken on the Big Island by Dr. McClatchy. And by the relative size of the people, you can see how large these could get. And here we see another one, somewhat smaller, with one of Will's young daughters standing in front of it. In this case, you can see it has stone side walls on three sides, and then is open in the front. And here we can see a canoe housed in, in one of these canoe houses. So men's work of various kinds then would be conducted in the haliwa. Now in terms of frame posts, these had very complex notching patterns, and I'm only going to show you a couple. And it's important to realize there was a fair amount of skill that was involved in making these houses. And this had to be passed on from one person to the next, one generation to the next so that the interlocking pieces of wood would fit appropriately and make for a stable and also a very symmetrical structure. Now the wood parts of the hale were lashed together primarily with uki uki grass. Uh, the leaves of uki uki grass were used. Or on the Big Island especially, the roots of ie ie were used. Now in the previous lecture I showed you why EAEA roots are strong due to the fibers that are present in the roots. Also, we'll see later that uki uki grass also has fibers in its leaves that make it strong and suitable for a type of cordage to lash everything together. These are the flowers from uki uki grass, Dianella sandwicensis. Uh, this is in the lily family, and we don't necessarily associate members of the lily family with having very strong and sturdy leaves, but these do looks are often deceiving. Very beautiful flowers, though they're fairly small. EAEA, EA, on the other hand, we know more about it from the previous lecture. It has very strong and sturdy, robust roots. Uh, here are the inflorescences of EAEA. EA. On the left is the female inflorescence, and on the right is the male inflorescence. Uh, this is a little exceptional in that the male inflorescence is actually a little more colorful than the female one. This slide shows you some of the notching patterns that were used to join the various wooden elements of the house together. Let's not worry about the details, um, but just notice the uh, sophistication and the precision with which these are made. Now, this was especially important when we consider the ridge post, because this is probably the most vulnerable part of the holly and the most difficult to secure the thatching to, to keep the roof together and to keep it waterproof. And you'll notice that where the various rafters cross, that there are other elements placed above and below the rafters, and then we'll see later to secure them in place to keep this structure together. Now, as it happens, the Halle here at the Bishop Museum is the only preserved, authentic dwelling in the state of Hawaii, at least that's my reckoning of this from my reading. It was originally located in the Mil Oli'i Valley on the island of Kauai. Unfortunately, most of the original Hawaiian dwellings had been destroyed by 1890, and it was probably the remote location of this particular structure that saved it from being lost forever. On this slide, you can see photographs on the left of the, the wide angle shot of the valley. We can see there are two hale in this picture. The one on the upper right that has a little box on it is the one that we see here at the Bishop Museum. And then the picture on the right is a close up of the hale, showing that it existed on a, a, a rise above the, uh, above the bottom of the valley. Now, of course, the thatch had to be removed. It wasn't probably in very good shape. And then the structural elements were brought here to the Bishop Museum and put together. And here you can see essentially the skeleton of the Hale uh, before it's been thatched. The dimensions you can see on the left suggest that this was a house for a common person or common family and not for the Ali'i. Now this cartoon shows steps in, in the construction of a house like this. Uh, no doubt there probably were more than one way to build the house, but this is something I got from the literature. First, the corner posts were put in, and then part of the platform was built around them. Then the rear wall was constructed, and then the platform was completed, and then the front wall was constructed. Then a type of scaffolding was built inside, 
and the rest of the house was built around that. And then after that, of course, the entire structure then would be thatched. Here we can see a picture of the Halle after, shortly after it was constructed. And you can see today it's still in, in very good shape and looks very much like it was at this particular time. Now, peely grass, which I may have already mentioned, peely grass was used as the thatch for this particular holly. And it was the preferred thatch in general in Hawaii, especially on drier sites, that on wet sites we'll see that holla could have been used as a thatch. It's very light material. It's fairly sturdy, durable, lasts for a considerable period of time, and is a very pleasant uh, thatching material to use. And, Probably the interior of the house was a very comfortable place. Now, in terms of the house posts, I'm going to mention a number of plants that, that were used. Uh, one common plant, now these are all, of course, going to be woody plants, was called Uhu Uhi. And I have trouble pronouncing that. Uhu Uhi. The scientific name is Ces alpinia cavaiensis, and it's in the pea or legume family. Another commonly used wood for the, the main bearing posts was Nio, Myoporium sandwicensis. And these were actually the woods that were used in this particular holly at the Bishop Museum. Another commonly used source for the main posts of the house is a plant the Hawaiians call A Ali'i, or Dodonea viscosa. Another commonly used source of posts was Mamane. Sephora chrysophila. This is another legume in the pea or bean family. So there were a number of plants that were available for use by the common folk to build their houses. Another one is called Hua, Nestigis sandwicensis. Now, of course, you will probably know that the Hawaiian Islands were once known as the Sandwich Islands, named after the Earl of Sandwich, I think. I'm not sure about that at any rate, and thus the second part of a lot of these scientific names, which refer then to plants that were first identified here in Hawaii, we see sandwicensis. And more. <laughs> this plant, ka kawila, kawila, reputedly was used to make house posts, but kawila wood is incredibly strong and very dense. So I'm somewhat skeptical about this, but I'm putting it in here just as a reference to say that it might have been used, but I think it's a little unlikely. The scientific name is Alphatonia ponderosa, Kawila. Now, I mentioned earlier that uki uki grass leaves were used to uh, lash together the wooden elements of the house. Uki uki grass was also used, as we'll see later, uh, to lash the peely grass thatch onto the wooden elements. In the central picture, you can see one of the main rafters on the roof with some of the thatching rafters running horizontally away from it. The uh, cordage that is used to fasten these elements together is all from uki uki grass. Now, the uki uki leaves were dried and then they were braided. The strength comes from the fibers that were associated with vascular bundles in the leaf. And remember from the last lecture, I call these fibrovascular bundles. Also, the uki uki grass has a relatively thick cuticle, and consequently, it would shed water. And as we know, if, if something doesn't shed water, fungi are going to grow on it, it's going to rot, and would cease to be useful. So it had a thick cuticle to be waterproof, and it had lots of fibers to make it strong. In this photograph on the right, you can see actually a ball of uki uki grass that was put together much like a ball of string or yarn. So it could be stored like that and then brought out for use when there was a need for it. And this photo was taken at the Bishop Museum. This is a cross section through uki uki grass at the middle of the leaf, which is actually the strongest part of the leaf. Notice all of the cells that have stained blue in this photograph. The blue stain indicates the presence of lignin, and as I told you, lignin is the chemical that makes cell walls incredibly strong. Also, these cells have very thick walls. And this is where the strength of the uki uki grass comes from. Now, if you look at the right side of the image, towards the bottom, you'll see there's a relatively thick, somewhat translucent layer on the leaf. That's the cuticle. And again, remember, the cuticle is what makes the leaves waterproof and protects them from rotting. Now, I already mentioned that 
the size of the house depended on rank. It also depended a little bit on the size of family. And there were permanent dwellings that were made, and also there were seasonal dwellings that were used for seasonal activities. Kamehameha the Great was probably the greatest alihi in ancient Hawaii. And he had a very large compound that consisted of many dwellings. At the promontory or summit of this location, there would be his heiau. And then, surrounding the heiau and lower down on the slope, we see other types of dwellings that were specialized in this case. So, for instance, there would be a men's house, a hale mua. This would be kapu for women. Then there would be a hale noa, a sleeping house, and this would be shared by men, women, and children. Then there could be a hale pea, which would be kapu for men, would be reserved for the use of women. And then there could also be a hale aina, this could be called a woman's eating house, but it would be a place where women and their children would be together, both for meals and during the day, for childcare and for daily work. In addition, a high king like Kamehameha the Great might also have a separate cookhouse and also a separate storage house. Uh, this is a drawing that was made of a uh, heiau. Uh, it was drawn up in the late 1700s just to give you an idea of what the ceremonial dwellings look like in a heiau. Now these would not be occupied during most of the year, but would be used during important religious ceremonies. But the individual dwellings in general had the same style as the other houses that we've been discussing. But of course they would be made from the finest materials. And when it comes to the alihi, the wood that was used for their houses would be ohia lehua, for instance, or koa. These were woods that were reserved only for the highest members of Hawaiian society, so the best materials and the best craftsmanship uh, for houses of the alihi and certainly for these heiaus. Now, on this page, there is a link to a presentation I put together on heiau, but it goes beyond the scope of this particular uh, lecture, and so you're welcome to look at that, and during the course, I'm sure heiau will be discussed, and you can compare what I've found out with what other people present in terms of the heiau. Well, as already mentioned several times, Pili grass, heteropogon contortus, was the preferred thatch for most Hawaiians. Uh, bunches of, uh, okay, now let me back up. This is a bunch grass. What does that mean? It means that when you go to pull the plant out, the entire plant comes out as a bunch. And all of the stems then are fastened together at the base. So that makes for a unit structure that you can pull out of the ground and then start applying to the house. Now these were attached to the aho or purlins, the thatching rafters. And you can see in this photograph on the right the base of one of the uh, bunches of peely grass. Uh, they were applied upside down on the outside of the holly so that when water would land on them, it would roll down off the edge and hopefully make it to the ground. If the base were pointing down, the water would tend to collect in the base, and of course they'd rot, no more thatch. In the photograph on the left, you can see one of our former graduate students, Debbie Carino, who worked with Kurt Daler. And she's sitting down near some clumps of peely grass. This is just to give you an idea of how tall the peely grass could be. Uh, grasses, believe it or not, do have flowers, and those are illustrated on the right, although they're pretty small. They are flowering plants, but they're considered to be monocots, like sugarcane, for instance. Now, peely grass had several adaptations which made it waterproof and strong, and we've already talked about this. They had a thick, thick waxy cuticle, which made them resist water, and also they have a lot of fibrovascular bundles, which gives them strength. So looking at it, you wouldn't think that this is a strong material, but it actually is. And this is a photograph that we looked at previously that shows the various parts of the fibrovascular bundle from peely grass and also shows you the cuticle on the surface. Here's a small clump of peely grass that has dried. Notice that it assumes a sort of reddish color. Uh, it also has a very pleasant aroma. The reddish color was associated with the alihi and was thought to be a very desirable trait. Plus, having a pleasant aroma made it a good material from an aesthetic point of view. Now, in terms of applying the thatch, usually two men would work together. One person would 
begin on the inside, and then he'd have a partner that would follow on the outside. On the inside, for whatever reason, the peely grass actually was turned upside down so that the root end was down. And then they would be trimmed, probably above and below, to make for a very nice, neat-looking interior thatch layer. And then on the outside, the peely grass clumps would be turned upside down, uh, right, with the root up and the stem down so the water would roll off of the peely grass. This shows the interior of a holly thatched with peely. And I think you can see from an aesthetic point of view, it's very pleasant. And I wouldn't mind living in a place that looked like this, very beautiful. Uh, on the left is a skeleton of a typical uh, gabled house. And then on the right, you can see a gabled house that's partially thatched on one of its side walls. And I think you can see that the peely glass, grass clumps are indeed oriented upside down. And they're really applied like shingles on a house. You start at the base, the next one overlaps, and so forth and so on, until you get up to the top of the house, the ridge. And just a couple more illustrations of peely thatching on the left inside, and on the right, a close-up of the outside where the thatching is incomplete, but you can see the orientation of the Peely. And then a closer view from the Halle here at the museum showing the bunches of Peely and then the lash and twine made from uki uki grass. So uki uki held the rafters and all the poles together, but it also then was used to bind the Peely to the framework. And then here's a drawing from um, that shows the how the Peely grass was applied um, to the frame of the house. And what this shows uh, is that the peely grass bunches could be rather long. In the museum, the report is that the individual peely grass clumps were anywhere from 30 to 60 inches long. And in general, the process was started at the base of the house, and at the base, the ends of the peely grass then would actually be pressed into the ground, into the platform, and then people would move from the bottom towards the top. We call this a cropital making overlapping layers until the job was finished. Again, this shows you the braiding that occurred. This would occur on the side posts and also on the ridge post. Any place where fraying might take place, the, thiele, the peely uh, patches then uh, would be braided to give them stability. Well, holla or pandanus tectorius was sometimes used as a thatch. Now, holla leaves are very thick, they're very sturdy, and they're very water resistant, but their thickness and fleshiness could make them subject to bacterial or fungal decay. Now, this use of uh, hala seemed to be more uh, associated with the big island of Hawaii rather than some of the other islands. And it's also thought that the hala was used on wetter sites where the peely grass, even though it resists water, uh, you know, if it were located, let's say, on the Hilo side of the big island, where there's a lot of rain over a long period of time, it might not have been the best thatching material and could have been replaced then by hollow. The leaves were dried, flattened, then they were soaked in water so the thorns could be removed. And probably they were dried again before they were applied as a thatch. And just a close up here showing the uh, fruits from holla or pandanus, and then also an example of a holly in the lower right hand side where the pandanus was used as a thatching material. There are reports that um, sugarcane might also have been used as a thatching material, although it probably wasn't a main source of thatching. But again, another monocot which shed water has lots of fibrovascular bundles, so it could be a good thatch. The key, which also can shed water, uh, was sometimes used as a thatch material although it probably wasn't the main source of thatch for Hawaiians. Basically, the key leaves were soaked in water to soften them. Then they were gathered into bundles, and then they were tied onto the frame by using cordage made from key leaves as well. And then, in addition to that, the, the key leaves were, were braided to provide a, a very tight structure, and you can see that in the images on the right-hand side of the slide. All right, the final step in house construction was finishing the ridge and then also the hip rafters. So the ridge on top of the house and then the rafters on the edge of the house come all the way to the ground. 
these were the most likely areas to suffer from wind damage and needed to be secured. Now, finishing these off was preceded by a special, special ritual. Um, so as we saw with the Pico, there was a ritual involved with that. There was also a ritual involved with uh, uh, taking care of the, uh, the horizontal uh, ridge as well. Uh, the way this worked was that bunches of Pili on both sides of the roof uh, were extended and then they were intertwined or braided over the crest of the roof. On the left, you can see we're at the stage of construction in the museum house where you can see that the peely is sticking straight up over the horizontal ridge. That would be braided then. And furthermore, there would be other horizontal poles added above that. And then this process would be repeated again and again depending on how many additional horizontal poles were added to the ridge. On the right, you can see a finished house. And you can notice how the ridge is raised over the rest of the roof. Now these additional poles that were placed over the horizontal ridge are, were referred to as lolo by the Hawaiians. And the, this house probably has only one lolo. Uh, three would be the maximal number of lolos that were added to stabilize the ridge. Now in addition, it has been reported that the tree fern, Sadlaria cyathioides, was also sometimes used to finish the ridge and the hip rafters. Presumably, this was a little more sturdy than some of the other material, like the peely, that was typically used. This happens to be an endemic species as well. And on the right, you can see a picture of it with the Gale Murakami. Now, this is interesting. Uh, one of the final stages in house construction here at the Bishop Museum was to put a fishnet over the entire house. That way, when the peely grass dried, it didn't curl up, but rather it stayed in a flattened uh, state. Finally, the lanai. Uh, the word lanai and the concept of a lanai is, seems to be something that's inherent in Hawaiian culture. But actually, it's thought that the lanai, as we know it, was a post-contact development. The word in uh, traditional Hawaiian meaning would be like a small grove of trees where perhaps people would congregate in the shade during the daytime. But then that was ap applied to these porch-like -like structures that were produced. Uh, the lanai was absent in, in early drawings and consequently, as I said, is thought to have been a post-contact development. Now finally, here are the references I used in preparing uh, this talk. And um, in the future, we'll try to uh, bring a native person into the picture who actually is more knowledgeable about actually you know, constructing a house like this. But I hope this lecture at least has served the point of introducing to you the various housing styles that were used by ancient Hawaiians and the various materials that were used. And then I do want you to relate that back to the previous lecture uh, on why the materials that the Hawaiians used actually worked. Um, some of the materials they had to discover when they came here. So now, no doubt, they went through a trial and error process to find out which plants they could use for various functions because there were only so many plants that they could bring with them on their canoes. And the vegetation here in Hawaii is very different from the vegetation that they were probably used to in greater Polynesia. So they had to be creative and they had to be systematic. And there's a tendency to think that science is a Western kind of invention. Well, it isn't. You know, all peoples are scientists. They learn through trial and error what's going to work, what's not going to work, and so on. And so I hope some of that also comes through in, in these two talks. So thank you very much.